Easy. Possibly sell Thundle. Well, I will do my very best. Um, I have been able to get it to the minute of 50. Uh, maybe I can move fast and we can um, definitely get time to answer But please, if you have a question, I'll be more than happy to elaborate. Um, type it in the chat for me. But it is that time of 11 o'clock. Do you guys think I should wait some more? Or are we ready to... Uh, get things rolling this morning. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and start. I'm going to go ahead and start on our first slide. It's just me uh, showcasing. Oh gosh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we're here at Educational D&D for Seven Beyond. My name is uh, Blue Park Uh, but I'm also known as Vasily Genutsu, so Geo to my students, Mr. Geo. Um, so with this one, we'll be hitting the target with gamified learning. It's all well and good, but imagine if we can think and move beyond that which is impossible. We'll be looking at teaching practices that can branch your curriculum, looking at classroom management, behavior, accountability, and SEL. Um, I know all this sounds very impossible, but if we think about more than five impossible things every day, this method of advanced gamified learning incorporates popular D&D style game uh, with hands-on activities, quests, and projects. So let's come on and uh, quest with us, if you will. I know we'll be looking at the answers of advanced gamified learning methods, um, so this is technically probably a sequel to a session I did um, two years ago, but uh, I will summarize that as best I can so we all, I don't lose anybody too much. And also how to set up educational D&D in your own classroom, because I would like you to take away and actually use this. So on to my next slide. So why is this important? I know I'll probably get the critique of K or Abacus that I'm using wonderful buzzwords here, but I've, I've always really looked at Gamified in earnest and trying to figure out how it can work. Trying to engage and getting our students involved seem to be getting very, ever so much harder. It's getting to the point that our students have forgotten the joys and funs that come with learning. And now I teach mostly high school, so certainly if you're in the elementary school setting, you don't have this problem. At least I hope not. I would get excited to be learning if I was with Miss Frizzle or Bill Nye the Science Guy. They tapped into the wonders of the imagination, whether with amazing visuals, catchy songs, or a well-written thread that connects the story and its characters along. That thread was the pursuit to learn. Regardless whether you were right or wrong, you were encouraged to make experiments and, you know, do what they did. And I kept my rain catcher that I made for years after I'd made it watching the magic school bus and learning about weather. I didn't become a meteorologist, but it was fun nonetheless. I would uh, be put into the thick of it. It was exciting. It was action orientated. You know, educational cartoons were very fast paced, immersive, and, you know, real life shows such as Bill Nye the Science Guy. And not saying that we turn our classrooms into TV shows, but I will say that the next best thing would be gamification. And as a teacher, encouraging the use of critical and creative thinking to solve problems is something a worksheet or problems from a book can't do. So let's begin, shall we? Uh, so we can get to the fun part, right? Uh-oh. Did I not click that? I did. Uh-oh.
so what is exactly gamification? And I'm summarizing this immensely. I'm not going to give a dictionary definition, but I'll definitely give what I found to be true. That, you know, gamification is all fun games, except when it's challenging your students to overcome obstacles while they're seeking reward. Utilizing various gaming elements to encourage your students and engage them to create immersive learning experiences. I'm sure all of you have seen the old Jeopardy PowerPoint review games. Uh, we've been doing it for years. Heck, I remember doing it when I was going through school. But a lot has changed since then. Lots of ideas, technologies, and innovative minds out there have opened up the possibilities to more intertwined, intertwined games that can be weaved into your core content, or a fun Freedom Friday, if you will. Uh, for such a review game, it can be simple or complex. Uh, you can uh, make it, but... One thing is for sure is that, well, it will get your students moving and it will try to get them to solve problems, especially if there was a prize involved. Oh, there, that could be a trip to the prize box or chest with candy and other fun goodies. I threw in Nutri-Grain balls and fr fruit jerky on a whim and I was surprised to see them snatched up. The, the prizes could be extra credit or, you know, maybe a fun ticket system where the winners would be ones to receive a, you know, uh, a coupon for no homework or maybe headphones. In a class, we know that they're opening songs with music to when you're doing attendance. But for us teachers, goodness knows that actually learning and, and getting their gears in their heads to actually start turning, I would say, and, you know, have better luck with more involved, complex setups like the one I'm going to uh, prefer to show you today. But any way that you can purposefully break, break the monotony will get anyone participating. Always hopefully, right? Uh-oh. Receive a that did get cut off. My apologies. So I always share resources. I am a huge, huge reader of books. I do watch plenty of YouTube videos and TED Talks, but I will say I do enjoy my books. And I'm sure you have probably seen these already. And you're not gonna believe what I'm about to tell you about these. Is that you know when I first made World of Atrial, which is my educational DD. I use some very, I use now outdated tools, but they still had a good foundation for building research from these great minds. And a lot of inspiration and formatting for World of Atrial um, came from Jane McGonagall's Reality is Broken book that came out almost a decade ago. I can't believe I'm about to say that this book came out 10 years from today. It is beyond me that we have come to to this sort of monument challenge that you know and learn and mourning the loss of soul ken robinson i guess you got did you guys know that he died i this was like the first thing they showed at my educators program was the changing the educational paradigm ted talk and you know it's one of those you know if you want to have change happen in the educational system you know you got to be the change and i really took that to heart but the terms that Sir Ken Robinson were using were gaming and computer simulation or comm side terms used way back when, uh, followed by James Aldrich uh, Gee, because they became the birth of a new foundation for something that's called game studies. And it didn't exist before. But again, with reality is broken by James McGonagall. And I've also provided the link to Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk. Again, maybe it might be a good refresher on goodness knows that's probably 15 years old by now. But, you know, other important folks would be What in Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy by James Paul Gee and Learning Online with Games, Simulations, and Virtual Worlds by Clark Aldrich. You'll see that several types of these things we found in, you know, new forms of this new academic field called game studies. And there are some other books. Again, I don't recommend you get all of these books, but you are definitely more than welcome to. I am for someone who likes building a library of sorts. If I wasn't a technology teacher that I am today, I would probably have been a librarian. I don't think I could have made it out as an English teacher. I don't think I could have read so many essays. I, I'm a, I, I like to read for content and quality, not just to be fast and doing it. But so during the summer, I've always involved trying to learn new things. And so some of these other books have popped up trying to incorporate a deeper connection to content, also looking at social emotional learning, um, trying to take a uh, look at self-care methods, empathy, and, you know, building relationships with students because, you know, 
I can't penalize students because they're not feeling well. That, that's not right. I know if they're struggling and they're having difficulties, I always want my students to come talk to me. Um, essentially, New Age School Influential Wokes and Resources lists um, would not be complete without talking about, you know, them utilizing Google Classroom or John Megan's um, Adrenaline Rush near the top left, you know, helped adapt my paper and pencil methods into a more digital, flashy interface. And it really made the difference for how it looked and appealed to students. It, it became a part of that buy-in process. Um, two other books that I don't have on there is, of course, Robert J. Monzano's The New Art and Science of Teaching, and then Angelo Duckworth's Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. I have so many of these books. Again, I have I like this educator's library, and that some people come by my room and like offer and uh, borrow some books. Right, right. But again, books are wonderful, but heaven knows my I would not have my grains worth of salt if, if I didn't have my master's and I didn't talk about white papers and research. Um, so this should definitely be uh, hitting on people's uh, note cards uh, from years ago, but still talked about even to this day with Lisa Dolly's social networking knowledge construction, where emerging virtual world pedagogy um, paired with uh, Bandura's full principles of social learning. I found that these two complement each other very well. Um, and so there is more information on that. And I have provided a Google document folder that has a lot of my research that I do. Um, I do lot, look at different white papers that aren't just for virtual learning. But, um, you know, um, looking at social circles, social constructs, and things of that nature. But I will say that if you ever want to really do something like this to do a, a, a gamified learning experience, you have to involve your administration and you have to get the students to buy into it. Because if the students don't really feel like doing it, you're going to do a lot of work for them to not want to do it. You, you have to give them your best 30-second uh, uh, elevator pitch, you know? And you with STEM and technology and engineering classes that I do this in, you know, I am guaranteed to have a good crowd of, you know, people that like this stuff. That, you know, they're a little bit nerdy and they might be geeky and they're like, maybe they've done Dungeons and Dragons or D&D before. But again, I've changed it and I've simplified it so it's not as hard. But I am thankful to have approval from my administration um, showing my assistant principal the research that I had and the thoroughness. Of, of my explanations and, you know, reasoning, um, she gave me approval and, you know, she was always telling me to build on it and make it better. And so I always uh, build on it and I always add on to it each year to, you know, make it bigger and better than it was last year. But again, I will say that once you get a good consensus from your students, it's going to be that buy-in process. Uh, once they agree to do it, you have to commit to doing it. You can't just be flip-floppy about it. You have to want it you have to be your kind of your own hype machine because i always believe that you have to finish what you start you don't put away a board game until you finish playing it heaven knows my household would have a running game of monopoly because you couldn't finish it in an evening um it would take us hours to do a single game of monopoly my my family is very competitive when it came to board games i would have wished we just kept puzzles on the table but nope every now and then we'd have monopoly out and everyone would be competing to be victorious in Monopoly, right? But again, this one is a recap slide from a previous uh, select uh, from a previous uh, lecture, um, just to give you a base of you know what is involved um, with some of the requirements for educational D and D. Um, some of these are just your base key components that I found to be working and very successful for both the high school and middle group middle school group it could definitely definitely be done at an elementary school level but be mindful that you really need to simplify things as best you can because if you don't do that they will totally be lost so um with the just these seven components it is i agree it is a task that is something that people look at and they're like oh that's that's i can't do that that's too much but, you know, it all kind of walks into each other. These are not terms that I want you to be afraid of. Um, semi It did. Alrighty. Let me see if I can copy and paste the rest of that. I'm sorry it did that. Oh, goodness. Second life. How could you? 
It must be a lot in there. Thank you, Hypatia. And cut off one more time. I apologize. Um, with Semionic Agents, it's just getting a friendly face for students to connect with that isn't yours. So that they can always kind of connect and see something through their eyes. Because this Semionic Agent is going to be connecting them with the story, this educational d and um, is going to allow them to move the curriculum, move the content and SEL without it being all shoved, without you being the professor on, on the podium. So there is a bit of storytelling involved. I will say central theming is involved. Um, we When we go to different areas, there's usually a different period of time that we focus on. Sometimes it's uh, we go from like medieval to steampunk to a cloud kingdom that has futuristic technologies. Um, so it really lends itself to a growing world. Oh, thank you. I need to find what happened to my copy and paste. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry. Yeah, that would happen. All right. Oh, here it is. Here it is. So I've always had very unique results with character creation. I know that I've had to change things uh, because students wanted to all be a singular race, and I couldn't have that. And I really wanted to have diversity play a role so i'm limited to that only once that one race is taken um nobody else can beat in their party when i say party in when i when you read my slides it says sequel band and so they're not parties they're not groups i've used my own internalized uh simonic content to bring sequel bands they are the seekers of knowledge and uh the seekers of light in uh, the world of Atrial. So they're not just students, they're not just engineers, they're not just scientists, they are seekers and they're trying to find the truth and help the world that they're in. And with anybody that knows like the beginning of definition of engineering is that an engineer is someone who makes things that helps people. That's the core definition of what an engineer is. And definitely getting students to understand that is uh, a process that is fairly monumental. Now, again, um, these other ones are going to pop in throughout the rest of my slides, so I'm not going to go them detail by detail. But these are the five advanced gaming concepts that I have for you that will I, that I will be talking about in detail for you. Uh, these five advanced gaming elements um, for gamified learning um, can be broken down into five individual sections. Uh, they have conflict is the first one followed by strategy and chance, followed by aesthetics, both is theme and story, and lastly is rewards. I don't, it is a mixture of both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation that powers my rewards. It is not always going to be something that is a solid thing that they receive. Sometimes it could be something digital. Sometimes it could be a secret item for a quest down the road that could really help them to, if they uh, figure out and solve it. Yes, I love having my students write their backstories. I had some kid do like a Phantom of the Opera, but he was kind of like a vampire, but he always carried an umbrella and he made the umbrella a weapon for his character. And I was like, okay, I'll allow that. Because you're essentially the dungeon master and, you know, whatever you say... Yeah, whatever they want has to kind of go through you first. You have to filter it. So looking at that first section of conflict, what exactly is the conflict? Now, the conflict is not just, oh, there's a dragon and you have to save the maiden in distress. Oh, how generic -y fantasy is that? When we look at conflict, it's not just the external factors, but also internal ones as well. Um, so... I have a very differing mix of conflicts that are presented to my players that they are meant to overcome. And sometimes they're solely story-based. Sometimes it's meant for characters within the story, um, the NPCs, if you will, non-playable characters. Or it's a real-life challenge that they have to build in real life and accomplish. And that is those STEM features and a part of engineering. Because I 
have, have to treat it as a project-based learning, if you will. So my STEM challenges are weighted as project grades, which is worth more than anything else in my class. There are various types of conflict that can be built um, with this game-based learning. Um, designers incorporate conflict um, to help arise not only within the world, but also within their other players, uh, where you know learners may be pitted against one another. There is a sense of collaborative learning that can be also built within the challenges and that all players must work together to overcome. Learners can be pitted against the game itself to create excitement. Designers can also represent real-world conflicts that learners can learn to deal with uh, this type of conflict that, you know, having it be not through a rose-scented glasses type scenario, but giving them a chance to kind of experience that and put themselves in other shoes it is almost a sense of narrative learning and kind of like role-playing different scenarios that they wouldn't have normally approached in real life or well, they could have but again i always want to empower my my loners to instill with them the skills that they need for once they leave high school i know it's a fantasy game but critical thinking creative thinking collaboration these through just these three c's alone are 24th century thinking skills and so my school is all about trying to prepare students for 24th century my next one is strategy and chance. Strategy and chance is often something that you find that will increase the strategy, or I mean, will increase the complexity of the game depending on how people look at it. Um, if you've ever played chess, you know that, you know, there's lots of different combinations of moves. And, you know, even though you want to always get the king, you know, there are other things involved as well that isn't just you know, claiming the king. You could be trying to block out the opponent. You need to take the other pieces that are going to limit your players, the enemy's movements or advances and what they can do to you. But with strategy-based games, it puts a lot of control into the player's hands and they get to form decisions that they can make um, that can affect the game in play. Um, and their odds of achieving this are, of course, based on a D20 die or D10, depending upon what it is they're looking for. On the other hand, games that are heavily based on chance put the player in a highly reactive mode, where they have little control over the outcome. For best learning delivery, I found with serious games should combine a bit of both strategy and chance within the design to make it more interesting. Most challenges within the work scenario of corporate employees are multi-layered. The problem that they encounter within the game can be based on chance, while the solution that they came up with can involve the element of strategy. The blend of both chance and strategy gives the loners something to do and also provides a well-needed relief every now and then, a respite, if you will. Uh, next up is aesthetics. Now, I know the next two seem similar, but I promise they are very different. So, aesthetics is our first third advanced uh, component of it, gamified learning. And when we talk about aesthetics, yes, they all, yes, they do make the game look pretty, but if you are a seasoned game developer, you would agree that aesthetics consistently, using them consistently, not just when you feel like it, but, you know, really theming your worksheets, theming the world that they're in, you know, it has an area of high appeal instead of them just, oh, this is what we're doing. They'll be like, hmm, cool, and they can share it, they can show it, and they can interact with the different components within it. If I'm doing stuff completely digital, um, there might be secrets embedded into my PowerPoints. Um, there might be hidden Easter eggs that might lead them to something um, new and exciting or might lead them to a secret item. But with these aesthetics, the visuals are a powerful means of engaging players and helping them immerse themselves in the game experience. In video games, aesthetics are a huge part of this experience. With learning games, the temptation can be, you know, to cut corners on aesthetics, and they don't realize how much it impacts, how much this impacts their learning and how much they value the game. Even if the emphasis of aesthetics in educational games is usually comparatively low to that of entertainment games, it is a necessary to create certain amount of visual appeal within learning games. I believe it does. But I know that budget constraints, you know, they do include monies and for dedicated graphic designers of the game or online resources, you know, there are other ways to, you know, 
have aesthetics without breaking the bank. And so there's always open game art. Um, you can find graphic bundles that you can download and use them. Again, you would follow a Creative Commons or a, a license so you don't break trademark or intellectual property law or whatnot. Um, especially if I'm doing my stuff for education. I'm not reselling anything. Um, so I'm using it to teach, which is always under fair use. <laughs> I uh, have game templates here that cut out people and graphics, as well as some other uh, just game board-esque templates. But I do create a lot of what I uh, present for my students. So the difference between aesthetics and theming and story, because theming and story and your aesthetics, although they go together, they do not and are not the same thing. Um, you'll see on my theme and story slide that I have probably the best board game to film ever um, clue. And this um, has great, um, if you've watched the film, if you've, if you've done like the original board game, you can see how well it ties everything together um, to the best of its ability um, to really fill that how that that multi-story house the traps feeling the confinement just the style and look of everything really does uh bring things together a theme can add interest and create engagement within the learning of the game the theme can be conveyed with visuals and with a brief backstory that is included in the rules often when themes are introduced within games there is no accompanying narrative running through the through the game but the attic the attic Oops, sorry about that. Thematic elements are used to convey the idea of theme with minimal story. However, an entire storyline can be inserted within a, a learning game to make it interesting. Story offers a narrative thread that pulls through an entire game and offers twists and turns, and you never know what might happen. You never know who is that main boss at the end. Is the person that you've been fighting just a puppet? Is it something else? You're not quite so sure, and it is this running mystery that your students kind of have to kind of solve as they continue on through your story. Yes, very true. Yeah, I can play a version of Clue in Second Life. Learners find it easier to remember facts when they are part of a narrative, and more than just simply drudging up facts devoid of any story or context to them to create a storyline for effective learning games it's important to keep in mind that a strong storyline has these four elements uh while it does take considerable effort and a lot of creative thinking to come up with a with a strong string story if you will with different paths um it is certainly worth the effort uh where your four elements of story are characters plot something that has to happen for it to be in the story tension often thought of as conflict and last but not least, a resolution, a sense of end or a tying up of loose ends. And when we do this, each village or each section they go into, um, it changes every month, um, the area that we're in. It gives them a different theme. There's a, there's a, there's a master story and then there's a town story that they might intertwine with each other or they might be completely just opposed and... You have to get out of this town just to get over there. But there's usually something in between that, you know, helps make that happen. So they're not completely lost. At least I always try to make it so. But last but not least is rewards. It wouldn't be fun to just play a game and to not really get anything. I'm sure you would be rather bummed if you uh, were in a marathon race and you didn't get... Uh, your gold medal or your trophy, right? I'm sure that would bum you out. And, you know, although I, I do believe the reward should be the grades and having accomplished and learned something, um, definitely having something for them is um, something that they can hold. Sometimes it's showing off, not all the time, but, you know, it's some, and for most times it's just things to improve their characters or to help level them up. 
Rewards are all things or can keep be keepsakes that players own throughout their gameplay. Now, the new wave in loaning games and in gamification of loaning is to give players achievements for accomplishing certain tasks or hitting certain milestones. There, there's a general trend towards giving lots of rewards, but game designers have to use them effectively. A popular strategy is to reward players for completing boring or menial tasks which are necessary within the game. It is also important to give rewards or points for performance rather than completion. For example, giving someone a badge for completing a section may excite loaners to hit completion even without understanding the concepts within the game. However, if the reward is given by completion of a section to a certain standard of proficiency, it will certainly encourage loaners to perform their very best. Within a game, score is a very powerful motivator and feedback tool, if you will. The player should understand the ways of accruing points or other incentives as well, and this will motivate them to play better and to uh, learn better. And there's a link in there to a website, Learning Industry, that can talk about this in more detail. But I really, I would love to just try and take grading away and just have them learn for the sake of learning and not have it tied to grading. But with our current public education system, it just it is very hard to do so. I know, right? So, putting games in the context of our course content. So, there are some uh, words that we were able to look over um, during uh, the previous slides. But I do want to let you know that, you know, semiotic content. When I talk about that... That signs that it means it stands for something. It might have different meanings in different situations or contexts, practices, cultures, and historical periods. Uh, that word, periods, it could mean a historical significance. If I'm talking about chemistry, periods is, is the columns um, that's sort of fold onto the periodic table of elements. Or period as in English grammar, it ends every sentence with a period. So in that example alone kind of tells you that depending upon what class and what context you use something in, is how your students are going to learn what to do with it. Semionic domain is a set of practices that recruit one or more modalities to communicate distinctive types of meanings. Internalized view and external view, um, these are how we present the game. So si internal view is signs within the game that produce meaning for the game. Uh, these are signs that define the game, especially in terms of the genre signs in the game for the genre not outside of it now external view when you see the external effects of the game as simonic domain on culture and the society and i say that within your classroom not the school in general or with anything else now games as a cultural object might affect the culture there they come from so that's again being mindful of you know the diversity of students and you know we don't want to be making anybody uncomfortable or upset by appropriating their culture, which I'm not. Um, I keep myself, uh, again, very grounded in fantasy, so we're not um, taking anything out of context for my students. But we'll find that G's principle to immerse your students within the world of your subject is tied squarely to how well internal view and external world view are communicated. Um, and then these are just system designs for grammars and their POV, the perspe uh, perspective of view. But, so looking at these terms, uh, we can see how they kind of meet up together in this diagram. All right, this diagram is showing how all of that, all those different concepts that we talked about previously, is able to interact with each other with the student. My student is this black cat here, and he is understanding certain things, and he lives in the real world. But the conceptual, the top of this pyramid here, is showing us that that fantasy, both the critical and creative thinking sides, and having them interplay with each other. And then the other side is signs, and that's your simonic content, and how all three of these can be balanced within each other to provide this internalized reality that's bounded within the external. And so that is that is the main goal. If you ever if you've done game studies, this is something that you would totally review, I promise. <laughs> oh, I did not paste that. My apologies. At least I don't think I did. I did not. My bad. 
didn't copy and paste the correct thing. But you're like, so that's great with course content, but how do I get that to work with social emotional learning? Well, I'm so glad you asked. So I have three characters here from a previous uh, quest log, as it were, um, from a previous uh, class iteration of World of Actual. World of Actual changes every time my class goes through it. They have different people, different villages. Some of the quests might be revamped to fit the area that they're in, but for the most part, everything is it feels new and exciting because I don't want the people who did this already to spoil it for the people in the past. I have some students that come back and, and they visit and they're like, oh, have you gone to this part yet? And they're going to totally ruin a story plot point for me. I'm like, why'd you say that? Anyways, here are three characters right here. I have Kai, the star main cast, the Volvicus, and Vupin, the uh, um, Avianus. Um, these are just three out of the ten races that I have. Um, I originally only had like six different races. And then over time, I've added more races and I've added more classes or jobs for people to play as. So not only do I limit... Um, and promote diversity within our group based on having everyone be different races, but also having everybody be different classes because not everybody can be a healer. Not everybody can be a, a, um, an archer. <sighs> I'll say I had to nip that into the bud the first time I did this because I don't know what it was, but everybody wanted to be archers. And I'm like, so nobody wants to heal. And these were all middle schools at the time. Right. I'm afraid not. Um, I have not worked multi-classing into this uh, particular game because I have a very different form of... Because I can't... I only have them for a short amount of time. So um, they, they are, we are based off of a ranking system. So I don't have it on um, on this slideshow. It was on the... When I did... This is like part two and part one, I kind of went over it. But you'll see, if you look towards the right of me, You'll see three uh, World of Actual uh, PowerPoint slides over here, and one of them is for races, one of them is for class, uh, for classes or jobs. And if you go through classes and jobs, um, you'll see that I, I, my jobs level up based on ranks and how much experience points they gain. Um, but to working in um, social emotional learning, um, each of these characters had a um, a weakness in their uh social emotional learning that we were working on kai the star main was someone who was very distrust uh distrustful um he didn't trust anybody very well it took uh, it took him forever to warm up to us um he was very rough with us he didn't he wasn't very nice to us um but when he when it really came down to him needing help um he was able to swallow his pride and do that um, the middle one is Cass the Volvicus. She was running away from her family and her responsibilities um, because she had a lot of pressure on her to do amazing and great things, but she just uh, couldn't do it. Um, and so she uh, kind of just ran away from home, if you will, um, on a, her own self-quest of curing some um, disease um, that was very difficult to cure. And last but not least is Whoopin, who has a very sad backstory, um, having almost destroyed an entire town um, by being an, an amazing hacker, but not always knowing exactly what he's doing. He just is naturally gifted in the arts of um, computer coding. And just a few simple keystrokes here and there and can definitely cause quite a catastrophe, if you will. And so he is... Uh, he has survivor's guilt uh, being the only uh, family member left after something like that happened. It was very tragic, um, but he is trying to make it. He's kept himself very far away from coding uh, because of this, and he knows he he always finds his, himself going back to coding, even though he tries to keep himself away from it. And so my students are learning these different social, emotional, learning, and wellness concepts through them. Exactly. I think empathy, em empathy is very hard to do when students have to kind of learn about it through real people. I know it, it when we're all watching those uh, TV shows during Christmas and they have the dogs and puppies that are, are going to be uh, put into the sleeping because nobody's getting animals. And so you have to pay money to have them protect the animals or there's no water in some third world country. And those are all very important things. I'm not saying they're not, but they definitely are a super duper buzzkill. 
and you know people just become non apathetic because of it and i don't want that to happen to them and so having these characters in there with problems that they themselves they hopefully they can kind of see themselves experiencing and then you know they all normally have a happy ending unless the character unless the people of my students have other plans now i will say sadly that i have one group who is striving to kind of overturn the bad guy which i've never really had people do before because they just wanted to take over and i'm like what how did this happen <laughs> so i i gotta work on them <laughs> yes so uh my next slide is kind of talking about preparation kind of what goes into all of this and goodness knows i know it looks like a lot i had a giant whiteboard set up for days with pins and cork boards um, just to have things on there for me to figure out what I was doing. But you know that it starts in the top left corner. And the introduction, that first month that I have my students, um, or the first, at least the good first two or three weeks I have them, they are doing, they're learning to work with each other. We're working on collaboration skills. I'm experimenting and seeing who works well in what groups. And... So this character building, so this is when they make their characters, they kind of fir uh, form their first initial sequel bands um, in that intro part, but then we go into that first quest. And so the first quest is giving them that first experience and trying to understand what is this, because it's something that they've probably never done before. Um, so we kind of walk on together. And in this uh, example, I've shown a catapult. Um, they had to destroy a magic tower, which was poisoning the surrounding farm field and so that was their first quest they did they got to build and they resourced catapults and they got to make their own and then in the classroom they had to launch their catapults and then they had to knock over a tower that i had built um for them to knock over and then whichever team uh, team that knocked it over um got a got the uh a secret item uh for them but it is about them turning in their research them showing their progress um journals and talking about their experiences and then tying that with um i have to do some type of peer review evaluations because there are some people that will just social loaf and not do anything and that makes me very sad i hope that i'm trying to be engaging and very open to lots of different things but there are just some kids that are determined to not do anything which makes me sad um, so I had the peer review reflections that will let me know who was working, who wasn't, and what kind of great grades you would give people. And so that can, if people give a high grading to somebody, I can add on points to their base uh, score. Or if they really won't do anything, this is where I start taking away points. And they'll be like, but my other team member got a 95. How did I get an 80, 82? And they're like, well, you weren't doing this, this. I made some notes because you were on your phone because you weren't doing what you were supposed to be doing. Like, there were these things I look for, and I and everybody notices that you're not pulling your weight. It's true. Well, you know, I, I always want them to experience and try and do everything. So whenever we are in a town or a village, um, the first two or three weeks, um, we'll, we'll open up a quest board, which will have multiple quests. And you can kind of see that to the right side. Um, now, I had these layered and sticky notes, too, at one point. But after we, the story kind of threads itself of them getting into a town that they're not familiar with, them making friends, them learning about what is happening in the town that they need to fix. And then they end up with a project at the end where they are physically building something and overcoming something. So these are actually engineering challenges, but I've formatted them and I made them into a sense that has worked in the story. So the, the, they would have already built a catapult, but having them be in, immersed into the storyline allowed them to be more excited about it uh they all were really competitive and i got some very unique and interesting designs um we were building a bridge building bridges is one of the uh earlier things that you do with engineering uh having them build a lawn about um buoyancy by making their own boat um aero uh, dynamics we had them test out their own airplanes um, that they made and aerospace was looking into the future uh, where they were researching spaceships and they had to uh, 
make a long distance spaceship. So it was something that was really uh, something that I enjoyed working on. And then there was at the end an announcement of winners where I have a tally going for the groups based on what they're doing. Oh, I'm glad you asked, Day Miami. The cat for the catapult. Um, all of my stuff is very easy to find and get a hold of. Um, catapults usually popsicle sticks. Uh, bridges they get access to balsa wood. Um, boats uh, they get cardboard and duct tape. Um, aeronautics uh, they have access to uh, again balsa wood, but parchment paper um, to make a wing. Um, they um. They make their first. They make a kite. Then they make a propeller. Then they combine their knowledge of aeronautics to create a an actual walking uh, pl a plane that they throw, and we see which one goes the furthest. Ah, oh, I try. <laughs> Sometimes I hope it works. Um, again, and then these are the, like the quest boards. Um, they will change um every um every other week. Um, and so they don't have to do all the quests on there. I really did like when we were, um, when the pandemic, um, happened, we gave them kind of like a choice board where we had different assignments and they got to choose what they got to do. And I think that was a great prelude into quest boards, having them choose the quests that they want to do. And the quests offer different gold amounts, different experiences. And if you ace it perfectly you can have the possibility of getting a secret item that can help you down the road and so it is always great to have them kind of see who's picking and choosing what right uh, at least i i hope so <laughs> but let me um go ahead and copy that so i do oh good i do have some time so i wish i could do the day one and the day two three of gamify learning demo um I don't, do we have something happening at Iron Claw? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, I, my brain is focused on here uh, with our different quest boards. I know. Yeah. Okay, so this is one of the openings that I did um, to get them kind of immersed into our world. This is the first one. Um, oh, I didn't even click my side. So I'm going to kind of introduce you. I'd be a storyteller. I would have my story slides up on my screen. I'd shut the lights off and then our story, uh, our story slides would begin. So I want you to imagine that you guys are on a plane headed to your dream destination. You've been planning this trip for months and you can't wait to see and experience everything. You can finally check this off your bucket list. The stars move past the wing. It lulls you to sleep. Your noise-canceling earbuds help you fall asleep easily on this long plane ride. You've fallen asleep, drifting off into dreamland. But then... You are suddenly jarred awake by a flashing glow above your head. The fastened seatbelt sign is on, and you can't help but think something bad is happening. As you remove your earbuds, you, you hear the cracking of lightning and the booming of thunder. All around you, rough rain turrets against the passenger side window as you stare out. Surely you couldn't have been sleeping that long, could you? Normally you have a hard time falling asleep, but to be in such a deep sleep to not hear this ghastly storm, your eyes fixed outside. A flash and a bang. Lightning strikes the wing of the plane that you were looking at. You feel yourself tense up. An air supply bag falls from the ceiling compartments. Everyone is panicking. You can hear yourself think. No, you can't hear yourself think. So much going on. Your plane is going down and, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. You black out as all the adrenaline and stre stress hit you like a pile of bricks. Time seems to stand still, and you don't know if you have, if you're, if you're asleep, 
alive or dead or somewhere in between. You feel the warmth of the sun as you slowly wake up. As you wake up from your pro temp sand coffin among some unknown beach, passengers and bags are scattered all around you and in the sea. You're dying of thirst and your arm is burnt by being in the sun for too long. You reach into your pocket to get your phone, but it is waterlogged. You must have fallen in the ocean and then drifted onto the beach shore. You're thankful to be alive, but you think around you and there appears to be no signs of civilization anywhere. How those survivors begin to stir and you all decide to trek around and inward the island. You find yourself uh, hoping for any signs of life, for any signs of hope. You do come across a dilapidated old check that's seen better days. You find a note pinned to the wall by a sharp rock affixed to a stick-like spear. A note worn and old, but able to still be read. Dear whoever finds this, I have been stuck on this island for who knows how long. It's been years, and I managed to make it off the island. You can too, as long as you have your wits about you, and the dangers of the island will not be so bad. There is treasure on this island if you can find it. But I would imagine getting off the island would be better. Well, what's the point of being rich if you have nothing to do with it? Anyways, whatever you do, don't make Tamatoa Tiki mad. He's always watching. Your friend, Banana Jack Esquire. And so, they would have to... These are their assignments. We have different stations settled around uh, for them to uh, peruse and to solve the little mini puzzles. So, usually logic uh, puzzles and critical thinking um, to get them thinking about certain things. Um, I've also have provided a easy to look at stamping card. It helps with grading to keep track of who is doing what. And so um, I know I, I, I knew I'd hit right on the time, but thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, please, uh, my email is provided in my uh, no call down there. Um, I'm always available for questions. I'm sorry I didn't have much chance to do uh, 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 to answer any uh, questions to, to open up for questions. Uh, there was a, a lot to go over and I apologize. But thank you guys so much. It's been great uh, being with you and presenting you guys um, this fun information. Thank you guys so much for coming and please have a great rest of your VWBPE and I hope to see you guys soon. Thank you so much. Uh, perhaps so. At least update people on what my students have done, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. It can be done. There are lots of different people that do educational D and D. Most some most of them will follow the traditional D and D uh, rule set. Um, I mean, I have my own dungeon master screen, so people can't see what I'm doing. Um, but I, like I said, I, I made my own world and my own characters, um, and races and stuff. It follows very lightly too. If you play D and D, my version will be much easier to do. Um, I don't have any like constitution or intelligence. Um, I've simplified the stats that people need to look at. Um, so again, making it friendly or for people that have never done before. And I, I can definitely say I have more people that have never done it before than people that have when I get to my high school level. So I'm easily was said with middle school. Um, but I will say that there is a popular resurgence with D&D. Like, I cannot tell you how many uh, people are doing D&D shows on YouTube and they're just changing their podcast into a, just a D&D session thing. Like, they're just popping up all over the place. And it's made it a lot easier to do it online. Um, I was able to do D&D with my friends online. And it's really easy. I, there was websites for, for dice rollers. Um, there are visualization screens and stuff that makes it a lot easier. And I mean, we do have battles too. So follow, usually it might be before or after the challenge, um, they have to defeat some type of boss area, uh, boss in the area. So they get to actually do, do combat in my game. Um, but nobody can die. They just kind of faint. Like, um, you cannot like summon devils or demons. You cannot outright kill anybody. I'm sorry. My game will not allow it. Because it's for school, and I've always been cautioned that if 
the school board saw what I was doing, would they really like it or would they really hate it and say that I'm brainwashing kids and stuff like that? I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not going to have that on my conscience. <laughs> I've played, um, I think it was like, um, when at Fantasy Fail, they had the tabletop gaming sessions, and so I would kind of just watch. Um, I think there were some games that you could, you could hop in. I think it was like something to do with kobolds, where you rolled and you had a certain amount of kobolds and they had to accomplish tasks or something. And it was a game that was like, all the instructions and stuff were online. And it was very easy to do. Like, you could just write down the info in on a notepad and you'd be good to go. Like, it wasn't anything serious. And I was like, at that point, I was like, I knew that the educational D&D thing can work as long as I don't overly complicate my my battle system. Now, I will say that I have some people that take forever on their turns because they have, like, five pets. And I'm like, one of these days, I'm going to cap it. Well, I have capped it at, at five. But, like, I, ha I didn't put a cap before. And I had somebody who, like, rolled really high on befriending animals as a hunter. And they had, like, ten animals. And they were, like, a giant army by themselves on their turn. And their turn would take, like, 20 minutes to get through. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I, ha I can't put rules in at that point. But the next iteration, I had rules for them. A day in my Google Drive where you find the world of actual stuff, you'll find uh, presentations that are called challenges, and that is where you will find those quote-unquote worksheets that talks about what they need to do, what are, the re what are the requirements, what are the design specs, what they have to sketch, how much they have to sketch, what their research is. Um, in those challenge slides is where you will find what the requirements are for the, building for the engineering building challenges or STEM challenges, if you will. But um, yeah, like I said, um, if you wanted to grab any of the, my Vushis, you're welcome to. And if you discovered that you could click on any of the characters floating around here, they would give you something. Ho, ho, ho.